Before we continue, we're going to talk quickly about the capacitors and the power supply. Very quickly, we're going to discuss this, these two electrolytic capacitors right here. These are in support of the negative grid bias that's applied to the EL34s. The other one that we're going to discuss is the multi-core capacitor here, the 2020-2030 microfarad capacitor. Now, these capacitors essentially provide the same function for two different circuits with two different polarities. You'll notice when looking at the schematic diagram on this one that the negative side of the capacitor is in the circuit and the positive is clamped to ground. That would make sense since this is actually a negative grid bias and the product right here is a negative voltage. This negative voltage is stabilized by the reservoir on the negative side of this capacitor for fluctuations in voltage. It also helps smooth out the ripple. So what you want to know about this capacitor is first, is it rated for the voltage that, that this circuit is using? And I found 450 volts is sufficient, and I believe it matches or exceeds the original specification for these capacitors. The other thing is the size of the capacitor, which will allow for the stability to be increased. By increasing the size of this capacitor, you are not changing dramatically or noticeably on any of your test equipment the resulting grid bias voltage. And even if you were, right after here are two potentiometers that adjust the grid bias voltage anyway. We've shown in a previous video how my air conditioner turning on and off with the 50s in place showed a ripple as the voltage dropped and then increased again and then came back down and stabilized. And at the second time with the newer capacitors, not only twice the capacitance, but also a better quality and much newer, reduce that ripple substantially. So this is all about stabilization and to a degree of fil obviously filtering the DC to remove the ripple from it. This multi-core capacitor serves the same exact function on a different circuit. Now on this circuit, all sides of the capacitor on the positive side are in circuit and the negative side is clamped to ground. Once again, obviously, because this is a circuit with a positive DC voltage. And this capacitors, again, allow for greater stability and filtering of ripple from the DC. What we're looking for is a stable DC waveform with as little ripple as possible. And what these capacitors do, broken up between each voltage drop, allow for the stability of that voltage because of that capacitor. So if the circuit should go with a lower positive voltage, it would be picked up off of the positive side of this capacitor, which would then reabsorb more positive voltage till it was filled. All this is about is stable DC. If you want to stay with the original values in the circuit, by all means, that's exactly what I did. However, if you choose to increase the capacitance to further stabilize the circuit, that wouldn't be bad either. I don't know at what point the returns would not justify the size of the capacitors you were putting in the circuit, so long as it was rated for the proper voltage. If you're still using the original quad cap, then I, I really don't know what to tell you because people will tell you, oh, they're still good if they still function. And if you don't have any equipment like this, that's really going to measure specifically what the leakage of these capacitors are and what their ESR value is. And then I don't know what to tell you. If you're going to start with uh, shoddy components, you're never going to get your amplifier to work right. So in short, we've discussed these two areas and how the capacitors affect them. They do not change the sound quality of the amplifier in any way. The center tap of both heater circuits also have a capacitor that connects it to ground. These are AC, about 6.3 volts, and the center taps come off of the coil right here. Instead of directly coupling this to the ground, which could be dangerous, especially if there was a failure in the transformer, it's a good idea to have something in place to allow AC to flow without directly coupling it. And this capacitor serves this purpose. I've tested this one and this capacitor appears to be okay, so I found no need to replace it. It is important to note, however, that you should be testing this capacitor. While we're discussing some components and their operation in the circuit, I'm going to talk quickly about resistors, and I'm going to mention this only once. People talk about different types of resistors that are used for these applications and audiophile grade resistors and all other crap. And the fact is, is that as long as you're using the right resistor within tolerance at the right wattage, we are not nearly at the frequencies in which the reactance of the resistor would play any issue with regard to the output of the amplifier. When dealing with 
equipment like radio equipment, ham radio equipment, when you get above about two megahertz, this becomes important and increasingly important, but it has no relevance whatsoever with regard to this amplifier. So if you're going to choose a resistor, be it carbon or other type of resistor, so long as it operates within the parameters it's supposed to, within the heat ranges it's supposed to, and it is a correct wattage, it will function absolutely fine. The next thing we're going to discuss are the capacitors and components that are on the board. And the ones we're going to talk about first are the decoupling capacitors right here that go to the EL34s. They're on the ends of the board here. After the signal comes out and is phase inverted, so we have a phase inverted signal, we end up with two signals. Those phase inverted signals go to these capacitors where the DC component is removed from them and they make their way to the EL34. If these capacitors are leaking, DC, then they are no good because they are no longer decoupling the, uh, uh, the DC from the resulting audio output, and therefore they're bad. So if you have a tester that can test them to ensure that there is no DC leakage, then that's great. But if you don't, you should probably replace them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to unsolder all of the capacitors on one side on the left channel, and I'm going to test them on this to see if it is the correct capacitance, number one, and number two, if, there, if there's a, a DC leak in voltage across the capacitor, if I could see a current at a certain voltage. And basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure them at their rated voltage, which is 400 volts DC. The first capacitor under test reads 0.1 on my meter. Uh, this meter has just been redone. I have another video and I will post it if you're interested to see how it was restored. So we know that the measurement of capacitance is good with this capacitor. Now what we're going to do is do a uh, leakage test for this capacitor and see what the leakage is. I have my tester set up to 400 volts and it's set for paper mica, which really means that the eye will start opening at about 2 microamps and will be completely open. If it's completely open at this point, then there is no leakage whatsoever that any of my equipment could detect, including my modern equipment. So I'm going to hit the leakage button and we're going to see what we get. So what we saw was the charge of the capacitor and then no leakage after it had charged. So it looks like this capacitor is good. If we wanted to get more specific information, I could hook an ammeter up and see exactly what's going on. The tester though was just calibrated and tells me that there is no leakage on this cap at 400 volts. For the purposes of this documentation, I went and included my micro ammeter into play. And what I found was that at 400 volts, and at this point already, it could just be an artifact of the meter. It's showing one-tenth of a microamp of current going through, which could just as easily be zero at this point because there's just there just really is nothing. This capacitor is good to 400 volts DC and does not leak. The capacitor for the front tube also reads the correct capacitance. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a leakage test at 400 volts and see what we get. You can see before I even do it, the meter does fluctuate a, a, a tenth of a microamp. So, I mean, I'm not really concerned about that. You ready? And there we go. This capacitor is definitely good at the rated voltage. There are no issues with this capacitor as well. The next capacitor, 0 0.05, also reads the correct value. What we're going to do now is we're going to run the leakage test on this one as well. This capacitor is also good at the rated voltage. There is no leak. This capacitor also reads the correct capacitance. We're going to check the leakage on this one too. And there is no leakage on this one as well. Finally, the last capacitor is good both in its measurement as well as its DC leakage. So all these capacitors are good. I'm going to clean them up and put them back in the board. I'm going to pull out the other ones and test those as well. While I had the components off, I also took the opportunity to clean the circuit board. Even though the chassis is not going to be reused, this board is. And I wanted to see how nice I could get it. It's a little barren, obviously, right now, without any components on it. Let me bring the light in. But if you look at the before and after, it was really thick, The uh, whatever had formed on there over time. It took a lot of cleaning. I used my uh, uh, Radio Shack electronics cleaner. 
to clean them up. Also, the resistors, I was able to get more vibrant colors out of them by removing the accumulation on them over the years. So I didn't go through it with a fine tooth comb, and that could be something that could be looked at a little more close just to clean it up a bit more when it's out of the unit. But we're not there yet. We are ready for resistor testing, which we can do, but I just wanted to capture that before and after. See how, how much I could get in there. You know, and then what it looked like back in the day. So, pretty cool. I was able to measure all the resistors, except for the ones in the back, the orange, orange, yellow, and these right here, the brown, black, red. So I'm going to see if they're attached to a circuit that's dragging them down. All the other ones tested just fine. The 270s over here that are supposed to be matched within 1%, both read 302, but they both read exactly 302. So... I'm going to have to take a look at that as well, but if, as long as they're balanced, it should be fine because I'll be making the adjustments anyway with the uh, with the potentiometer. So I'm going to clean up these capacitors. I already have one cleaned up, and there's what it looks like. It's nice and shiny, and here's one right next to it that hasn't been cleaned up, so there's definitely a difference there. So I'm going to clean those up, put them back in the board, and then I'll get started on the other side. I've replaced all the components on the left channel. After I've cleaned them up, tested all the resistors, and now I've removed all the components from the right channel. I'm hoping at this point that they'll all test good so I have a matching set of components for this board. I got lucky again, not only with these capacitors well within specification, but it didn't report any leakage whatsoever at the rated voltage DC. So these are going to go back in and join that set. I have a lot of cleaning to do beforehand, however. We're not done yet though. The resistors in the middle, I'm, sure, I'm seeing some burning on them after they were cleaned and that leads me to believe that they should probably be tested again, as well as the ones on the end which can't seem to be tested in circuit. So I'm going to pull out one side of each of these resistors and each of these resistors and test them again. And based on what I'm looking at, I may just replace these even if they test good because the, the, the heat damage that I'm seeing on the outside of the resistor bothers me. I've lifted the resistors I want to test out of circuit. Now I can get a correct reading on them. Even if they all test good, I'm still suspicious of the two over here and will probably replace them anyway. The back ones both tested good. The 1K on the left was 1.1, but the 1K on the right was 1.6. As I suspected, there was probably something wrong with it anyway. So there's, both of them are going to be replaced. I went and reseated the resistors in the back and replaced these two resistors. This is from my collection of European parts. So it looks a little bit different. I'll probably get the right resistor and probably a higher wattage, but this will do for now for the purposes of testing. At this point, we've made all the repairs on the amplifier we need to make to get it working. It's surprising to see how little amount of parts was needed to be replaced in order to do this. Basically, what we ended up with was this multi-core capacitor right here, two electrolytic capacitors under the unit, two resistors, and that's, that's pretty much it. I got some new potentiometers to put in here, but these cleaned up well. They'll go in the new case when the new case arrives. But for now, this will be just fine. So that's what we have. And we're going to start our signal testing from the preamp portion, the phase inversion, and then outward to the EL34s.